I ask you for understanding that I wasn't really prepared, you know. I, I know what Juliana is doing. She's the head of our text mining team. Um, but I'm not really in the core of that story. So forgive me if the, at one or the other occasion I have to ask, uh, for instance, Philip Sanger, who is, who is one of the team members sitting there, um, what a certain approach means, you know. But I try my best to guide you through something uh, which is actually complementary to what Lars uh, was saying. And I'm really grateful for all, you know, the overview that he gave on the principles of uh, precision recall and, and uh, error propagation, which we'll come to in a minute <laughs> when we come to relationship extraction. Um, basically, what, what I will talk about is, is belief, a semi-automated workflow for Bell network creation. And Bell, you know from my talk yesterday, that is the language that we use to model um, Alzheimer, for instance, or neurodegenerative diseases. And it's something that is well suited to represent causal relationship. Huh? That was what I said yesterday. And if you want to, to reason over causes, upstream regulators that are not you know, just one step above or so, but which are really forming chains of causation over time and over organs maybe or processes, then uh, you need actually to deal with um, defined relationships that have an orientation, that have a direction. Now, the, the big theme that we have been going through and through also in the course of this conference is uh, that there is a gap between basically an understanding level where we have uh, typically also um, uh, models available and the primary uh, world of uh, narratives, uh, whether they come as, as scientific um, uh, papers or in, in journals or in, in online sources or as health records and patents have also been mentioned and uh, in particular in the in the industrial context uh, they are of great interest so how do we come from here to a basically a model based representation of what's going on by the way if people talk about a pathway here a pathway is a model is an abstraction of something, and it's basically a mini-model. So we deal all the time with, with models, even if we don't call them this way. For the um, extraction of relationships, uh, there's a couple of different technologies available. Some are rule-based that, that has been tried for a long, long time, and I think almost to exhaustion. Um, there's uh, relation classification <laughs> approaches. And there's also what Lars already mentioned, the uh, natural language processing approaches that uh, analyze and reconstruct the sentence uh, structure. Now, what our um, aim was, was basically to find ways to increase the productivity of people who build uh, models of disease, for instance. Why that? Because the Alzheimer model that I showed you yesterday took us three and a half years to build. And it's almost completely manual work. Uh, it was supported by some you know, entity recognition and highlighting of entities in text, corpora formation, and so on, so that to, to, to narrow down the scope of, of a literature search. But it was not really uh, that a machine would predict that this is a causal relationship. This is something that could be transformed and encoded in Bell. But that is exactly what we are after. I should also mention that Bell is not, it's actually open Bell because it's, a, it's an open source uh, uh, language in the meanwhile. It was developed in the, in the pharmaceutical industry sponsored by Pfizer, but uh, it's now open source. There's also uh, SBML and Biopax, just as two other uh, syntaxes or languages that follow or that have been designed following slightly different uh, goals, but they are getting more and more interoperable and uh, they're converters, so they, we, we hope to be able to use information irrespective in what syntax it has been coded. Now, to fill the gap, to, to basically um, bridge between the knowledge that is in text and the formalized knowledge representation as we have it in in Bell models or SBML models. That is something uh, that we aimed at in, in our project. This project was actually sponsored by the industry. That's a nice example 
how uh, the biotechnology industry, so this is actually the tobacco industry, Philip Morris, is sponsoring an open source <laughs> Um, um, development because that is uh, largely publicly available. Now, well, I've, I think I can uh, go very, very briefly through that because I mentioned that yesterday already. Uh, one of the advantages of Bell is really that it can easily be read by humans and by machines. That is really something um, that that is very nice with. Bell, it's uh, a nightmare with Biopax, and uh, it's not very convenient with SBML, but uh, with, with Bell, you, you're really in a situation that um, Bell statements can easily be read, and, and the same is true for nanopublications, I should say. Uh, we have also seen that, that was the triple structure, the subject, the predicate, and the object, the, uh, the entity here, the relationship, and another entity and you can, uh, you have a very limited set, a very low complexity actually in Bell of uh, types of biological actions. Bell uh, squeezes the world of biology into a very simplified view of the world, which uh, other people all criticize, but the big advantage that comes with the oversimplification is that reasoning is possible, because if you, if you have a if you have a high, high complexity of all types of relationships, then you have a nice expressiveness of all the knowledge, but you cannot really reason over it, any, at least not with machines in automated fashions. This is a typical Bell statement. Um, it, it, it sets the citation, it tells you where it's from, so you can always go back to the, to the abstract at least, or to the publication, because through, through the PubMed link here, you actually have the link directly to the to the publisher and the, and the issue. So all the bibliography uh, information. Here is the evidence, that's an entire sentence. And this is where the Bell code has been taken from. This is where the evidence is hidden in. Uh, and then there is a couple of constraints. The, the contextual um, uh, text basically sets, or sets set um, about the tissue, or the, the disease context and this is the Bell statement itself. So all this information here has been casted into a rather simplified uh, triple. And there, there's more examples uh, for that. Um, one thing that we have also already heard is uh, the value of good uh, named entity recognition. Um, and actually, named entity recognition is something that the text mining community has been playing for a long, long time, and they had a long time to optimize it, and they did. But I show you also examples where tuning actually is necessary. In particular, if you go for several classes of entities that should be recognized all with high precision and also high recall. So we are good in the meanwhile in detecting uh, gene, protein, and chemical entities, disease names, and biological processes, and so on, anatomical structures, cells, tissues, bless you. Um, and, uh, and relations between them is, is something uh, that also, um, I should say, is contributing to um, modeling, getting away from the purely biological or chemical world, but also modeling the clinical world, reaching out to the clinical world, because that's something that we have not been very good at in the, in the past. And, uh, and the relationships actually, relationship mining is now giving us new um, momentum to, to reach out for true multi-scale representation of diseases. So things, what we Basically, the fundamental concept, uh, what we want to do and how, we've, well, how we want to solve the problem is that we have here some, we start with PubMed abstracts because that's always the playground that everybody starts with. It's the most simple thing. Um, we can do that in the meanwhile on, on full text, but it's computationally much more, more intensive. Then we, you do NER and normalization. NER, we have heard already, that's the named entity recognition. Normalization is basically all that mapping of um, terms to entities that may exist in databases or um, includes also synonym uh, mappings. And then we do relation extraction and have a bell writer, an interpreter basically that 
would cast the uh, evidence with a defined relation into bell code. And that's actually the belief workflow that Juliana and her team have been uh, building up over, over um, slightly more than a year of time, quite intensive work. Uh, you start with text, you, you do a um, standard, you apply a standard set of uh, uh, sentence detectors, for instance, uh, and other tools. Then you do the NER with dictionaries, with multiple dictionaries, ontologies. Uh, Go has been mentioned by Dietrich Ripold Schumann this morning. Uh, that is basically pretty much standard uh, in the meanwhile. It has to be maximized uh, in the performance because um, uh, of the following processes. If you have long, complex workflows, you have to make sure that you are as good as possible here in these early steps because later on, you, your performance will drop anyway. And then the, for the relation extraction, we actually use, um, we use uh, various tools, uh, open source relationship extraction uh, tools like the T's um, uh, relationship extractor. But uh, we have also basically done what Barrent and, and uh, Lars were talking about. We have used co-occurrences and classifier for co-occurrence to enrich, basically. So basically, we, we could also have our machine work on Barrens or Lars um, uh, co-occurrence um, uh, triples, basically, when they say A is somehow related to B, or is, is ex coexisting with B, that's, that's what they say. And we could then uh, hop onto that and, and try to find out what type of relation exists. Now, this is... Uh, we have seen that this is uh, named entity recognition, and if you, if you can, from a term here in, in text, link out to a structure, that is, for instance, what we call normalization. This is the mapping to a database, and we know that term means that stuff in, a, in Wikipedia or in any, any, any database. The typical recall and precision rates are between 70 and 90% for biomedical uh, NER. Um, so that is why I said that it's already quite good, and we are, we are happy with most of the recognition efficiencies. Uh, you always lose some, and you have to be, um, you have to be, let's say, uh, you have to keep in mind how much effort you really want to invest for, for basically getting here the 91 or so, yeah? So we would not spend any on the increase of, of 1% there. Um, Here's an example of, of different entity classes that we are, are tagging, that we are recognizing, uh, and the resources that we use for that. I don't really want to go there into any detail. I just want to tell you that some of those, and most of those uh, resources, are also Bell namespaces. That means we can reference to them, OK? We can point to them and say, this is what we are talking about. And these guys here, these resources are the authorities who, you mentioned that, or who, who mentioned authorities? Darren, you did. This is an important role for all the libraries. You are the guys who are the authorities, basically. You are controlling namespaces. This is one of the, the, the um, very important messages that we have to pass on also to the funding bodies. Who takes care of the namespaces, of the object you know, listings? Who, who, you have the <laughs> digital object identifiers, which is actually nothing else than playing authority. Now, here's the, the example uh, how much you can tweak a system, a complex system. This was uh, the, initial, the initial rates that we obtained with gene protein uh, names and so on in a more complex setting because you're tagging, a lot of, you're tagging a lot of entities and sometimes you have overlapping taggings and you have to decide is that a chemical or is that a, chemi and a protein which is stimulated by a chemical compound or so, or is that a ligand bound to a protein or so? And that's what, what I just want to outline is, or, or to tell you is, uh, and point your, draw your attention to is, that there is actually quite some potential in increasing the performance of such a system depending on the task. Uh, so it's not like, ah, here's a plug and play and throw it together and then uh, you will have a, 
Uh, so pragmatic text mining, as Lars was pointing it out, also means a bit of tuning always, yeah? Normalization is needed. Um, we, we combine various resources. We are also quite open. It's, we, we, are, we are largely free of the NIH syndrome and non-invented here syndrome. So we, we reuse stuff that others have done and, and, uh, and we also um, make a lot of our stuff freely available, of course. Um, open bell namespaces often provide no synonym mappings. That is one of the uh, um, the tricky bits where our tagging, our pre-tagging actually has to make sure that the link to the open bell namespace is, is uh, given so that <laughs> later on we can, uh, the bell writer can uh, refer to that namespace. Oops, there we are. Now the, the relationship extraction, that is something um, where uh, there's also a long tradition with uh, so-called bio-NLP tasks. These are also sort of competitions, and uh, um, this is typically that the scientific problem in the natural language processing arena is being exposed as a challenge to, um, uh, to the community, and people have to, or people actually do that, uh, similar to the track uh, competitions. People offer solutions to that and, uh, and then compare, finally, the, the solutions. And here is something that, that also these, these shared tasks also deliver resources that can be reused. So these competitions and these um, um, benchmarking uh, efforts uh, often deliver resources that are reusable. And that's one of the examples where Basically, a certain sentence uh, here, a given sentence, is be decomposed, and you always have a theme like negative regulation or expression here, which has words that are called triggered that actually relate to that or that carry the meaning of that um, uh, negative regulation. And um, we were using actually this. Um, uh, uh, resources from the BioNLP shared task because they were actually quite good for relationship extraction. But uh, we found out that we could improve the performance of the system with a binary classifier. This is exactly what Barrent and what Lars are doing, and also I think what, what Didri is doing, in, at least partially, uh, when we look at when we use co occurrence information. Yeah, basically the IL7 and the CMYK are occurring in the same sentence. So there is some relation, and the classifier just uh, says, yeah, there is a relation between them. This is the biggest problem in the entire workflow. This is the error propagation. Um, you may be some way in, uh, in, in the early steps already in the sentence detection and in the uh, tokenization, which is the recognition of individual um, words and, and stemming that is done, in the, uh, you, you, you um, basically give a label to each full stop and to a hyphen and whatsoever. Um, that there is always some error coming with all these different uh, steps. Uh, the NER itself has something like 15% error maybe. And then you accumulate that over the workflow and you end up um, with something that is in the range of 50% which is good if you achieve that. I mean, there were times when, when that was a, a high-flying goal to uh, achieve 50% uh, performance. So um, with increasing complexity, you have also higher risk for false classification or uh, error propagation as outlined here. Now, this is, this is uh, what we currently um, uh, achieve uh, it's something like a recall of 30% and a precision of 50% for regulation events uh, with, with, that, um, with that classical uh, relationship extraction um, workflow or uh, module in the workflow. Uh, the binary classification has boosted that, so we could improve um, with a with binary classifier that just says there is something related to each or co-occurring. Um, and that's why I say I, we could mount that on the, on the system that, that Barrent has introduced and that Lars has introduced. Um, it does not seem to be very promising if you, if you see these rather low 
performance indicators. But uh, actually, there we see something that Barend was already mentioning, which is the uh, redundancy of some of the relationships. So the, at least the obvious guys, the, 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 the very frequently reported directed relationships, we would have be, uh, no problem finding them. Um, but the tricky bit comes, of course, with the uh, only once mentioned relations, uh, which may be very uh, interesting and which may open a new, completely new view on a pathway or the role of a pathway or so. So that still needs some work to, to be, uh, for optimization. With respect to the Bell writer, we have uh, the, the Bell has a very limited set of, um, of relationships that it can handle, uh, which is good. It has, knows positive regulation, negative regulation, and uh, a sort of just association, so they, it could deal also with co-occurrences. Uh, it can talk about complex binding and so on, uh, degeneration, uh, modifications, and that had to be um, the Bell writer is basically set, using a set of rules where certain relationships are uh, classified into, um, into these um, Bell um, syntax. And that has been also uh, published. Uh, now, yeah, um, in, in that sentence that we had seen before, we uh, were able to extract actually the type of regulation um, that is in there. Um, don't get confused by the fix me. Fix me always is introduced in Bell when a namespace identifier is missing. So that just in, uh, indicates that there is uh, information or referential information missing. Uh, the binary classification just says that IL-7 is somehow related to CMIC, yeah? Whereas uh, here in the Bell statement, in that, um, um, in that type of representation, you have the repression, the negative um, regulation, you have it um, integrated. Um, what text mining cannot do is deal with really complicated nested, nested uh, uh, type of statements where, that are very often used, in particular in immunology. That, that is one of the nightmares for text miner. That, uh, that, uh, but um, we actually don't. We actually don't aim at not at all at a fully automated model construction using this type of workflow. What we aim at is uh, boosting the productivity of those people here. So basically, the, these, these curators that take care of the last 15%, as, as Baron mentioned yesterday, this is something that we have constantly in the loop. And what we know, uh, we, we wrote also some, some interfaces um, that, uh, where, where the machine basically um, proposes a sentence uh, and proposes a uh, first version of a, a Bell statement and gives it confidence uh, value for that. Uh, and then um, the, the curator, the Bell editor, basically the human expert, is, uh, has a uh, possibility to edit that, to delete it, or to export it. Export means into the knowledge base. You know, a deletion is it's crap. We don't want that. And the edit is the machine was not good enough. That needs to be mildly modified, yeah? And, uh, and that is a handy, a handy interface for, for curators. And that speeds up our model construction um, time uh, very significantly, instead of the three and a half years that we need for, for Alzheimer, we are now down to half a year for Parkinson, which is approximately the same complexity. Good. Um, we are organizing a challenge on that. Uh, so a, yet another competition where we ask the, um, the community to um, work on those tasks. Um, given textual evidence for a Bell statement, generate the corresponding uh, Bell, Bell statement that was um, basically trying to improve the rapid generation of complete Bell statements. But the other thing was also interesting. You have a model, you have a given st Bell statement, provide evidence sentences where the relation can be found. So basically you go into text and you, you use a Bell statement as a query and you get referential evidences 
uh, from text. And that's, that's also quite, you can play ping pong between models and text. Good, and now I'm at the end. This is the summary and outlook. So I've uh, shown you that um, text mining still plays quite a role, um, and uh, that we need to fine tune the text mining workflows depending on the application. Um, we need to harmonize namespaces used in a, in a modeling syntax with the uh, dictionaries we use and the ontologies that we use. That's why semantic frameworks are so important. Um, for protein-protein interactions, the relation extraction work is working nicely. For all the clinical things, the phenome, for instance, that Dietrich was talking about, there we would need to spend, uh, and we will spend, uh, substantial work into that and effort. Um, we uh, also would like to in integrate uh, further modules for relation extraction in the future and improve the overall per system's performance. There is a web service interface available for that, and there's an interface for se semi-automated uh, curation available. And uh, in the end, I would have liked to uh, acknowledge um, the contributions uh, done. This was largely sponsored by Philip Morris International, in particular Manuel Peitsch and his team. Um, on our side, Mark Zimmermann and uh, Juliane Flock and Sumit Madan, Alexander Klenner and Theo Mavison were working on that. And uh, Salventor is the company that originally invented Bell, and uh, they have the biggest Bell knowledge base worldwide. And uh, William Hayes and Natalie Caitlin helped us a lot uh, with getting that so far. Thanks. That's all.